Good morning. We don't have a Bible class period for me to ask a, a first time, so I guess everybody's woken up a little bit. That cool weather really does the trick. You know, something that Brandon had mentioned in his prayer uh, brought some things to, to my mind concerning the blessings that we have. And it truly is a blessing uh, and several blessings that we have in disguise this week at times. You know, I know that some are without water. Uh, it's very obvious that some are without the ability to, to get out of their homes. I know even uh, some this morning... This is the first place they've been since last Sunday uh, because it's the only time they've been able to get out together for worship. But I think what this week has brought us is, has, has brought us a little bit of a reset. It's brought us a chance to rest, a chance to spend time with our families, a chance for our community to offer acts of service to one another, to help out those who are in need, a chance for unity. And of course, this day represents a chance for us to gather together to worship God. I, I truly find it a blessing that many from other congregations that, that we can all unite together as, as a day of worship to God, a little bit of a, a glimpse as to what that glorious place that we're all striving for is going to be like, a place gathered with saints from all over, ready to exalt the name of God for eternity. Now, there's a lot of symbolism within doors, and for those who hadn't been here on our, on our Sunday mornings, we've been going through the I Am statements of Jesus, and so we're going to keep going with that, looking this morning at I Am the Door. And uh, there's a lot of symbolism within that. One thing that we like to do, especially in this series, is we're, we're wanting to go through and look at the significance behind this I am statement. That even just something as simple as saying I am the door looks back to a plethora of things throughout the Old Testament and even throughout the New Testament that help to point towards this Jesus being the Messiah. That point towards this Jesus being the one that was promised, that was prophesied about, that was sought to uh, come. And so in this moment when we look at a phrase like, I am the door, we don't just simply see a few words. We see a history that is painted throughout uh, moments in time. A picture that we have that is painted throughout moments in history that lead forth to the ability for Jesus to stand up and say something like, I am the door. And behind that statement does not just mean, okay, just that one specific mentioning of example, but points to things that they can look to throughout their own history, especially the Jewish audience that was present. Look to their own history and begin to see what this person is, who this person is, and the significance behind his being. And included within that comes a lot of symbolism of doors, not just in Scripture, but in our own lives on a day-to-day basis. When we think about things like a threshold, a threshold helps to represent a transitionary period. I don't know about y'all, but in every house that I've lived in, there's always one room that is completely opposite of every other temperature of every other piece of the room. And you notice that the moment you walk through the threshold. For some reason, it's 20 degrees hotter or 20 degrees colder. We're, we're, trying to, or we're starting to see that a little bit in our house. It's the first time we've had some severe weather, so we're starting to see which rooms stay warmer and colder. And you'll notice very quickly something that is right beside each other that's divided only by this small threshold is, is this great amount of transition, a great amount of change happens just through stepping through that one threshold. We can even look at an open door. What does an open door represent? Well, oftentimes it, it represents a sense of welcomeness, a sense of, of openness, a, a sense of wanting one to be there. And in the opposite of that would be a closed door. Instead of welcoming, it's excluding. We don't want visitors. We don't want somebody in. We don't want someone to appear. Why? Because the door is closed. It's, rep- it's this representation of excluding someone. What about a secure door or a locked door? That, that represents to us safety. It gives us a sense of peace. We go to bed at night, we lock the door. Why? Because it gives us a sense of safety within our own homes. What about multiple doors? You know, I, I, I immediately, and I, I'll be honest with you, I had to Google his name. Uh, I had to Google the name of Mr. Monty Hall from Let's Make a Deal. I, I'm, I know I'm young. I don't remember Monty Hall. My bad. Um, but, it, it, you know, you think of all of the work that he did in Let's Make a Deal. What was the, the premise of a lot of that, those multiple doors? It's to give options. It's to give choices. It's to give you the ability to make a decision. There's a lot of, of interesting science that goes even into that, that psychological process that people go through. And coincidentally, it's called the Monty Hall effect. That's how I actually knew the name of the host. That's kind of sad, but it's okay. But you see, there's a lot of symbolism within doors. You've got this transitionary period. You've got a sense of welcomeness or a sense of exclusion. You've got a sense of security or safety that is offered. And you've got a sense of choice. And each of these appears throughout Scripture in a very physical and in a very spiritual way as well. And that's what we're going to do today. We're just going to look at some of these representations throughout Scripture. So that when we see a phrase like, I am the door, it's not just this passive sense of understanding just in a moment, but it looks at the history of Israel itself. 
When he says, I am the door, uh, there in John chapter 10, you'll notice that he uh, uses that as a way for ushering in all these kinds of ideas. And specifically there in John chapter 10, you'll notice in just a moment when we get to John chapter 10, we'll we'll look at 7 through 9 is where it focuses upon that. You'll notice that in that moment, he uses it as a way of representing a lot of these. And in fact, most of these are represented within that use of the phrase, I am the door in John chapter 10. We, we start in Genesis chapter 6. You'll notice in verse 16, as was read for us, there's a description given of the ark door. It's a description given of the design that is used. And of course, included within that design of the ark is the singularity of that door. Now, what did that door represent? That door represented quite a few things. Now, uh, since it's just a description, we're not going to go back and read Genesis 6, 16. But uh, what does that represent? Well, to Noah and his family, it represented quite a few things. It it, it, um, represented a sense of welcomeness, welcoming the family into what? A secured and safe place. But once that door was shut, once the family had entered and the door was shut, what did that represent? Well, it, it represented exclusion. No one is left. Now, while that door was open, albeit not being multiple options on the physical ark itself, but multiple options as to who they will serve, it also represented that sense of choice. People chose whether or not they would follow after God, chose whether or not they would believe the words that Noah was preaching, chose whether or not they would be part of the ones who would be saved from the flood based on the decisions that they made concerning faithfulness unto God. What about the Passover door? Let's turn, if you will, to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 7 through 13. Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 through 13. Notice the command that is given concerning this threshold of the Passover door. They shall, make some of the, uh, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and, and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. Where they shall eat, um, th- then they shall eat of the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs shall they eat. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire. It is with his, its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt and waist on your sandals and on your feet and your, and your staff within your hand. So you should eat of it all in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment, for I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike in the land of Egypt. I want you to notice a few things that this Passover door represents. First and foremost, I want you to understand the way in which they're to be partaking of this offering. The things that they're supposed to do, they're supposed to eat all of it or anything that remains at least should be burned up. But included within that, they're to eat it fully dressed. It's dinner and they're they're eating it fully dressed. Have your belt, have your staff, be ready. Why? Because they are ready to depart. This is not just a promise of the coming of the the, uh, angel of death to, to take out the firstborn or to kill the firstborn sons of Egypt or the first one of those who did not spread this blood. This is also a a reminder saying it's time to go as Israel. It's time to leave Egypt. It's time to be removed from this bondage. And yet in this moment, notice what is the thing that separates those who lost their firstborn from those who did not. It was the blood of the Passover lamb upon the doorposts. So what did that Passover door represent? Well, it represented in a sense a, a piece of transition. A transition out from slavery into a land of freedom while also representing a sense of security and of choice. They had the decision to make as to whether or not they would be putting that, that, lamb, uh, that lamb's blood upon their doorposts. What about the temple door? There's this description, a beautiful description given of the temple door in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 31 through 35. There's several things that are represented amongst the temple door as well, one of those being the separation of the different parts of the temple. Not just the main entrance of itself, but even the veils that help to separate even it going back into the tabernacle as well as into the temple. What did those represent? Well, those represented great power. It, it, it represented a welcomeness as well as an exclusion. It, it welcomed a, a sense of safety and a sense of choice to be made. And in those moments, that beautiful description given in 1 Kings 6, in those moments we see that it ultimately... That temple door was, helps to paint this picture that leads us ultimately to this 
shepherd's door. If you haven't turned anywhere yet, I encourage you to turn to John chapter 10. And that's where we're going to focus here for just a moment. Jesus, and one of the things that we talked about in our introduction to this study is even the use of the phrase I am is beautiful within itself. The, the use of Jesus saying I am is, is powerful enough by itself. But yet to be coupled with all these other things is beautiful as well. When we've looked at a few of the others uh, that we've looked at, we looked at uh, talked about I am the bread of life. And included within that, we talked about all the different things that we can go back in the history of Israel and see where God pro- provided for His people, where God gave His provisional care or His love that is shown uh, to others. He did so in a way that shows His power to provide. And so when Jesus says a phrase like, I am the bread of life, He's a provision. He is something that helps to save and sustain us. We also looked at the phrase, I am the light of the world. Of course, light is a concept that goes throughout the Old and New Testament, even into eternity, which is one thing that we pointed out as well. So what about this door? When Jesus says, I am the door, let's notice in verse 7 through 9 of John chapter 10 together. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear him. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Notice what Jesus says specifically in verse 9 concerning this door. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. In this moment of, of, of the history of the people of God, you look back at all those moments that we can look through uh, throughout the Old Testament and look at these periods of transition. You look back maybe to the story of the ark and see the choice that was made to enter or not to enter into that ark. You look at the Passover door, the decision that was made concerning the, the deliverance out of the hands of the angel of death or the destruction at the hands of the angel of death. You look at the temple door and all of its beauty and what it represented and its division of uh, the locations of the temple and getting closer and closer to, to being in the presence of God. And yet in this moment, the door that is offered here is a door of the sheep, as we see in verse 7. And the one who enters into this door, verse 9, is one who is given eternal life. So what does this door represent? Does it represent the threshold of transition? The open door of welcomeness? The closed door of exclusion? The secure door of safety? Or the multiple doors of choice? The multiple options that one is given? Well, I would dare say that it offers up each of these as in a symbolic nature. A transition from the old man to the new. A welcoming of all who are willing to be a follower of Jesus. An exclusion of those who who denied to enter into that door. Safety given to those who accept Jesus as their Savior as a way of following in His will. And the choice, of course, is to enter into that door. The choice, the decision that is made that gives us strength and courage and comfort for eternity. There's a few other things that we can look at concerning doors. I, of course, am reminded of the action even of the cross. I know it's not a physical door, but it opened the door to quite a few things. It opened up a door for our salvation, provided for us an opportunity to be with God in heaven for eternity. Or the tomb door in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 6, as they go and, and, and check upon the body of Jesus, they find that that tomb door is open and that the tomb is empty. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what does that represent? Well, that open door it doesn't necessarily infer a sense of welcomeness, but maybe a sense of somebody's not there anymore. That door is open. It has served its purpose. It is no longer needed. Why? Because it's open. Because the tomb is empty. And because the risen Savior has risen. But the last place I want us to look this morning concerning doors is the ultimate door of choice. We find this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, where it says... Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go go in it by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. When it comes to the doors that we encounter within Scripture, and the doors that we encounter in life, there is no more important door than the door that is opened by our Savior. Than the door that is given to us as a way of transitioning out of this life and into the next out of the old man of sin and into a renewed creation, into a changed individual, one who has been forgiven of their sins by the blood of Christ. 
And there is no more important door that can be decided than that of the door which leads into salvation. The door that guides us, that allows for us to enter into that place of presence with the Father, with the Son, and with the Spirit. Giving us the opportunity to be in heaven one day. But notice the description given of those two doors concerning the paths that are, are given. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that, that go in it. Narrow is the, great, is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. So my questions to you focus upon the same questions or the same things that we pose within the symbolism of doors. My challenge for us is that we look to these doors as, as challenges. We look to these thresholds that God has welcomed us into as a time for transition, a time to change the kind of person who I am into who I am supposed to be in line with the will of God. This door is not just a door that has been shut already. It's a door that is continually open for all, one that is waiting for you to enter into it. The only thing that needs to be left out is that old man of sin. The only thing that needs to be removed or not in the presence is the old man of sin. Why? Because we're renovated. We're different. We're changed. We're renewed. We are a new creation. It provides us safety within the church, within the blood of Christ, within the forgiveness that he offers. But it's ultimately our choice. And that choice relies upon our decisions that we make every single day. Whether that's a decision today to become a Christian, whether that's a decision tomorrow to wake up and continue to serve God, whether that's a decision as to whether or not you will follow after the Word of God, after His will, or after His glory, or make the decision daily to serve yourself rather than to serve others. When it comes to the doors that we see within our lives, we must recognize those doors as moments for us to change, to be different, to be welcomed into the family of God, to take out that old man of sin, to be safe within the church. But ultimately, that decision leads only to us. Ultimately, that decision leads only to our being able to make the choice as to whether or not we will enter into the door that Jesus has promised to open for us and welcome us into the church. I know it's the case this morning that many of us are Christians, that many of us have been obedient to the will of God, that many of us have gone above and beyond fighting uh, even the snow, just to get here to worship together. But it might be the case this morning that the decisions that we have made have been the wrong ones. Yes, you've put on Christ in baptism. Yes, you've become that new creature. Yes, you've put away that old man of sin, but sometimes he creeps back in. Sometimes those decisions lead us down the wrong path. Sometimes the things that we do exclude uh, our Savior and welcome in that old man of sin once again. So if it's the case this morning that you need repentance, that you need forgiveness of your sins through baptism, or that you simply need to rededicate yourself to Christ, or need encouragement of the church, I would encourage you to make that difference and make that change in your life as we stand and as we sing.